I'm Josh Cooperman, and this is Convo by Design with designer Denise Guadalupe Rojas. I had the chance to chat with this DC, Maryland based designer about a lot of things, not the least of which, and you're going to see this, this comes out, this, this, this topic pops authenticity. <laughs> Think about it for a sec. Being authentic in all our creative endeavors is so critical to not just the work we do, but how we feel about that work. One of the things I lament most in this post-pandemic era is the lack of time and focus on authenticity and being authentic. Think about that for a minute. There's an art to being authentic. It means being not only true to yourself, your work, your friends, your family, but also the design concepts and creative process by which you work. I don't think it's possible to be completely true to any of these things in a time when every aspect of the business is so unpredictably fluid as it is right now. At a time when the on-again, off-again gatherings happen, don't happen. I was at Design Chicago, but bailed out of KBiz this year. And for designers trying to do the work only to have costs boosted by 30% or more on shipping and pricing, timelines continuing to shift outward and making it more challenging to remain creative and relate to the business. But we're also talking about how Denise in particular stays fresh, sharp, and focused. With this constant stream of reselects, it's draining. Draining emotionally, and that draws from one's ability to create and be creative. So we're talking about this and other ideas with an immensely creative designer. I I think you're going to like this this chat. I hope you do. We'll be right back with Denise Guadalupe Rojas right after this from our friends at Thermosol. For well over a year now, You have been hearing incredible conversations, interviews, and panels with amazing creative talent as part of our Wellness and Design Thought Leadership series presented by Thermosol. It has been and continues to be an absolute joy working with the entire team at Thermosol from the top down. This multi-generational family business has been producing the gold standard in steam generators, saunas, steam showers, and steam shower accessories for decades. Thermosol is the original steam shower with technology that is state-of-the-art, made and manufactured in the United States. The company's history with steam shower started by David Altman in 1958. Murray Altman acquired Thermosol's steam bath division in 1989, and the company is now led by Mitch Altman from their world-class production facility in Round Rock, Texas. The most successful designers and architects are using steam showers to maximize wellness, relaxation, and enjoyment for their clients. Thermosol is a staunch advocate for the design trade, and I am so proud to have them as a presenting partner of Convo by Design and the Wellness and Design Thought Leadership Series. If not familiar with the entire range of Thermosol products, please check out thermosol.com. And it's interesting to me that you mentioned the first thing you say when we start talking is that you've done um, you've done a couple of podcasts lately. So here's what's interesting: having done this show now for eight years, and I remember starting off with the show and and calling up designers. You know, this is eight years ago, saying, "Hey, I'd love to have you on my podcast." And the the two things: who are you? And what's a podcast? And um, things have changed a great deal since then, haven't they? They have. They have. And it's funny because I was listening this morning to your podcast from the last podcast. And you were chatting about how things evolve as crises hit things happening. And you kind of, it forces you to rethink how you do things. And um I remember my first wake up call to that was because I've been a designer for a long time and I, I'm not saying how long, but a long time. And um, I remember when the economy tanked in 2009. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it really, I mean, for the design industry, it was really hard, especially if you did residential work. 
And at that time I had a retail store and it made me look at things differently. And then I learned that, um, I mean, the whole, our whole industry kind of got shook up and, you know, it was kind of like what settled in the top worked and what didn't fell out the bottom. And, um, you know, like when you would order fabric before from manufacturers, it would be a situation where you can always get it in a heartbeat. It was instant gratification. And today, if a fabric is not a hot item, they don't stock it. You have to wait for them to mass produce it for you to get if you wanted 20 yards or beyond. Whereas a lot of the factories had things sitting on shelves and they were losing their shirts by them just sitting on shelves for people. So it's just life evolving and forcing you to look at things differently. I have a saying in my life that when it's time to shift gears to go to another journey on your another path on your journey, the universe shakes me up to kind of take a look at things. If so that's true, then there were a lot of people that need needed to be shaken up. Mm-hmm. 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 <laughs> exactly. I know. I said that. I I um when everything started, it's kind of like I kind of saw it a little bit coming. I had gone to KBiz in um, Vegas. Oh, we um, must have seen each other there. <laughs> with all those people. Yeah, we did. I was the lady standing at the sign. <laughs> but, um, you know, and I was there and I remember my flight took me to L.A. before it came to the East Coast. And I am a news junkie. I've become a news, a news junkie. And I was watching TV, seeing about the virus. And then when I landed in L.A., anyone, there were a few people in the, in the airport with masks on. And that made me a little nervous. And I'm like, huh, we don't have this at home. I don't see this at home. And that started me scratching my head. And I said, mm, something's coming that we're not prepared for. And so at the time I was taking care of my mom and I came back and I started to put things in place for my mom. I shut everything down from everyone coming in her apartment. So, um, so I just felt that it was, that was the, you know, the universe felt that we were out of touch with a lot of things and it's to regroup. It was a regrouping time for everyone. How is your business different now than it was 18 months ago? Very different. I never shut down, first of all. Mm -hmm. Um, I do works from commercial, multifamily, and residential. And because I was in the commercial aspect of a project, I got that instant email that said, you are a necessity. You cannot close down. So we had letters in our cars that if we got stopped for any reason, because we had curfews and stuff, if we got stopped, we were able to say, here, Mr. Police Officer, um, I'm a... I must be on the street. So it, I mean, but I mean, I've seen a lot. It's been good. Um, Being on the East coast, I looked forward to winters because if we had a really, really bad snowstorm and everybody was in lockdown, they took a little bit more notice to their homes. Well, it's interesting too, because prior to that, you know, I remember doing design influencer group meetings and one of the, one of the topics that came up was how with, you know, with, with the advent and availability of everything digitally, a lot of the creatives I was talking to had started getting rid of their libraries. They had, no, seriously, they started getting rid of the samples. And, and we had talked about this and in large part, uh, they were doing it for a couple of reasons. First of all, because they didn't want to keep getting more and more samples when lines would be discontinued because then it's like, well, what do I do with this? You know, I can't ship it back. They're not going to take it back. Now it's my responsibility. And some people in California, you know, there's a, there's a thought process that maybe is a little deeper about environmental issues and stuff in a, a dump than elsewhere in the country or in the world. Were you working remotely prior to this? Um, is that something that you, you've been doing, you've had your designers doing? And then when the pandemic started, because you mentioned you know, working on commercial projects, how did, you, how did you handle the amount of business that needed to be done? I did not miss a beat. Nothing stopped for me. I did not close down. We made an attempt of planning for that to happen. We tried it one day and it, no. And we just all met right back here in the office the next day. 
Um, and from there, I worked it from a perspective. I was very careful because at the time I was taking care of my mom who was in her 80s. And um, I balanced it out from buying lunch for everyone every day and letting the lunch be dropped outside our sweet door, leave the tip there. And then once the guy goes, we brought it in and we all had lunch. Um, we all were very careful at what we did. Um, we still went to job sites. Um, if there was a, one of the projects we were working on is with Turner Construction and they would keep us abreast on if there was any COVID issues that happened where we couldn't come to the site if we needed to, but everything just continued to work as normal as possible. I had a client that was building a new home in about an hour away, went to that without, without a hiccup and made sure that no one was really there for a crowded space that we did not know. Um, and we just kept things moving and being very careful. I love having a library because when you don't have those samples, situations like that, that just happened, you can work later in your office if you have things at your hands, at your disposal. I just felt in the years that I've been doing this, once you start sending links to clients, you start to open the floodgates for them to do their own thing. And in this environment, everybody thinks that they're an interior designer. Wait, what? <laughs> oh, yes. Are you, what? <laughs> I, I've, never, I've never heard that before. So, so that being said, though, that's the that's the spatial issue with other people. How did you once the delivery stopped, once getting product delivered, once getting product, spe, you know, specifying product and finding out that you can't get it or that, yeah, sure, you can get it. It's going to take 22 weeks. How did you address that? How did you cope? How did you insulate the business so that you could get what you needed in a timely manner? Well, it's really interesting because I never really saw the hiccup in the supply chain. I never saw that until now. Um, we continued to operate and specify and do everything else that we were doing and continue to move forward. It's now that I'm really feeling, you know, the ramifications of COVID from like we were expecting a, a sectional to be delivered at the end of the month. We were just told it won't be until the end of next month. And thank goodness clients are so understanding about that. Yes. Yes. You know, and I say that tongue in cheek, I think for the most part, most people get it and most people understand. There are, there are the, those few who don't, um, and it is what it is. How do, you, how do you have that conversation with your clients? And, and I asked the question, it seems really pedestrian. It seemed really pedestrian to me the first time I asked, it's like, well, how do you have that conversation with your client about not being able to get product? And it was over time that I realized that every creative has their own style, their own approach. And yes, I get it. Every client's different, mm -hmm. you know, and the first thing you do is you kind of feel them out at the same time. I'm asking because this is something that they don't teach you in design school, how to have the, the difficult conversation and how to smartly work with your clients to navigate it, understand what you can get from your showroom partners because you have that relationship with mm -hmm. your showroom partners, find out what's in stock, what's close to being in stock, what's doable, what can work, and then making it their idea when you have the conversation. And I'm interested, how, what's your approach to that? So the one thing that I think is the most important thing that a designer should have with their client is a relationship and the, the customer service beyond customer service. People buy from you because they like your footprint and they like what you bring to the table. And especially since you're servicing them. Um, that's an important part of the whole spiel. And the other ingredient with it is when they trust and believe in your vision, they're wait, willing to wait for that vision. And that's, that's, that's where you have that conversation that makes so much sense for them to be able to wait for it. Um, the one part of it that started to really make me realize that things were going to be difficult to get was when I was working on a multifamily project that had 20 units 
and we couldn't get appliances. That was the first red flag. The appliances, you had to wait for a year almost. One of the vendors told us, one of the appliance vendors told us that they weren't opening any new accounts or taking any new orders until 2021. We needed like 20 something refrigerators and they were like, we're not taking any new orders until 2021. And normally people are snapping to get that. Then what? <clears throat> and then, I mean, we waited and he tried to see, the owner tried to see what he could do to get stuff. And then he was able to work something out from the Home Depot side because we could not get it directly at all. You are listening to my conversation with Denise Guadalupe Rojas. We'll be right back right after this. I know you love talking about great partnerships the same way I do. Let me tell you about an incredible design partner who is working with us on the Convo by Design Remote Design House Tulsa project, Franz Wigner. A company created in 1899 in Attendorn, Germany. They started manufacturing brass beer taps. In 1921, the company expanded to Buenos Aires, manufacturing brass faucetry. The company launched in the U.S. in 1992, and Franz Wigner Premium Collection began in 2008. Franz Wigner crafts high-quality, premium faucets with the objective to create a design-oriented luxury product that exceeds the standards set by world-class designers and architects. Pretty heady stuff, and they do it. If you see a Franz Wigner faucet, it is stunning. You use Franz Wigner faucets, and they perform flawlessly. Product you can depend on after over 120 years designing a truly stunning faucet line. For more information and to check out the entire line of faucets, visit franzwigner.com. So I'm going to spell it for you, right? <laughs> F-R-A-N-Z-V-I-E-G-E-N-E-R.com. Thank you, Franz Wigner. And so here's what's interesting, and I, I want your take on this. And it's funny because having, you know, it's really interesting to me anyway, is that doing the show for eight years, up until year six and a half, m almost everything was done in person. I would say maybe a handful. So I would go to KBiz and I would go to Modernism Week and I did the programming for West Edge Design Fair and Fall Market and I would be, you know. When I started talking to other designers and other architects and creatives in other areas, learning how their specification process is really different. You know, I, I think I kind of took for granted that when you're in California, there are certain things you just can't get anyway. There are certain products that you can't get in California because they use too much water or because they use too much electricity or because, you know, you just can't get them. They, oh, they, wow. they will. There are, there are companies you can get, you have access to product on the East coast that they will not ship to California. Oh, wow. I never you, knew that. You didn't know that. Yeah. No. So, yeah. So there are certain toilets, shower heads, water fixtures in particular that you just cannot get in California. So what some designers, what they'll do is they'll get in a car or truck or drive to Arizona, drive to Nevada, pick it up. And then many people drive it in and then they put it in after the inspection. I mean, we don't talk about these things, but what I have learned is that designers are very, very resourceful because you have to be. So in an environment like that, um, let's take the appliances out of the equation because you, you can't really craft your own appliances. When no. It, when it comes to the other things, do you have a do you have a suitable amount of workrooms? Do you have enough to pick from a vintage and, and antique standpoint that you can reimagine into something that works? Do you have the resources? You know, maybe things that aren't coming from Italy, but mm -hmm. you, that you can still find locally. Yes. So I can share a couple of things that recently happened with me. Um, first of all, I'm known with myself that I'm a make it happen designer. No is not an option. If I have to get some little men out to make it happen for me, we're making that happen. Um, we just completed a remodel and a project for a client who purchased a home and needed to be in by the end of July. And we were there till 11 o'clock at night, but they moved in on August 1st. Um, I recently took part in a show house in the Berkshires called the Kaleidoscope Project. And I don't know if you've heard of it, but it was, it is a BIPOC show house. And two women out of New York, um, Patty Carpenter and Amy, 
both came together and got designers from all over the country to participate in this show house in the middle of COVID. It, we started the project. We found out about it. I found out about it in January, February. And I signed up to be a part of it, knowing that everything was hard to come by. And so in my room that I had, it was a loft space. So I had a loft, a bathroom. It's, a, it's an inn in the Berkshires. So I had, a, I had a bedroom, a bathroom, and all of this needed to be remodeled. Amy took care of all the remodeling, all the construction, while we all in various parts of the country, we would get on Zoom calls every ever so often to kind of go over where things are for updates. But we had to get a, get a lot of our own furniture and furnishings. Now we had sponsorship from certain people, but when it came to beds, I mean, everybody doesn't want the same bed in their room. So you had to kind of come up with what you needed to. So what I decided to do was find resources locally, Schumacher, Kravit were some of the fabric sponsorship that we had. And I purchased thing and I, things and I had them reupholstered. So that's what I did. Um, we have various model home showroom places here that had that did work for model homes. And when that is over, they put it into their warehouses and they recycle them. And the things that they want to purchase new of, they get rid of the old. And some things are relatively, they're in good condition. They've never been used. And I've re, I repurposed them to integrate them into the spaces. So it turned out really nice. Good PR from it. And it worked wonderfully. I think that is fantastic. And I also think that we're going to start seeing that a lot in the, in the very near future. And you know what? Not only don't I think it's a bad thing, I think there are going to be a lot of byproducts, good byproducts that come out of that. It's, it's going to allow designers to experiment with new things. I think it's going to help creatives craft new design lines. I think it's going to help manufacturers do some R and D in in real time, you know, market level R and D. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Which, let's be honest, our our industry doesn't really do that kind of research and development mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. it's not feasible, you yes. know. And for us, it's kind of like the 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 trade shows, the industry shows, which we haven't been able to go to for quite some time. Mm -hmm. Is kind of like the auto show you know, for the car industry, it's like mm -hmm. you go to the show and then you see everything and it's like, that's amazing. And then you get inspired again. When was the last time you went to a show? Was it K-Biz? And what's mm -hmm. the next show you're going to go to? No, K-Biz wasn't. Actually, I went to Furniture Market in June of this year. And I did go in October of last year. Um, that was a little different because there were less people. You had a schedule time that you had to be there. And we, I mean, all the showrooms weren't open, just like the last market, but um, those were the two last shows. And um, I'm going to go to October market and, um, but I'm looking forward to the rest of the shows, the things coming back on board so that, um, I mean, that's the stuff that you, you know, you get inspired by um, and you kind of see what's out there that you weren't even aware that was out there. Um, so I'm always amazed, especially when it comes to people who are doing multifamily stuff, not designers, but architects and their team of designers that are in-house, they go nowhere. How does one do that? But um, for me, it's kind of like that's the time to play in the sandbox and see all the good new things that are coming on board in the industry. Yeah, it is. You know, what's going to be really fascinating is it makes you wonder what what the what the manufacturers have been up to <laughs> trying to get um foam <laughs> foam was big wasn't it oh my god <laughs> and it all foam. happened at once yeah nobody saw foam coming no no you know steel chips these are all things you can you can predict but not foam no that's just very surreal. Yeah. So do you primarily stay on the East Coast or do you have clients outside of your, your general D.C., Baltimore, Maryland, 
area. I go you. anywhere that I can go and do work. Um, I am originally, I grew up in the Virgin Islands. And at one point I had a project there that I was working on. That was really great because I was able to go down there. And when I'm finished work, I can hit on the beach. <laughs> you know, it's, you know, it's funny too. If you can design in the Virgin Islands, you can design through any pandemic. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it's so true. I was speaking to a designer once uh, from Haiti mm -hmm. um, who, who designed in the Virgin Islands. And she was trying to explain to me, it's like, look, if you need something, you're not just moseying down to the Home Depot. You know, you're, you're not just going to the, you know, for me, it was the Pacific Design Center or, you know, the A&D building in New York. Mm -hmm. You're not just mm -hmm. going down there to, to do a SID test. Mm -hmm. And by the way, it may get there when it's supposed to. It may not. It probably won't. You just deal with it. And it may come in any condition that you least expect. <laughs> Which means that you also have to be part furniture doctor. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's the one thing. It's not the one thing. There's a lot of things. But that's one thing that I think is so interesting that I think many clients don't realize about designers. And I think I wish designers would would promote themselves a little bit more in this regard is that, you know, how to take the drawer, the drawers out of out of any piece of furniture you've specified because you have to. You know, you know how furniture is made most likely mm -hmm. because you've been to the factory. If you've ever had a design line of your own, you know how things are made. You know how they go into, mm -hmm. you know, production. And I think that institutional knowledge is so important yes, to what you is. do. Yes, it is. It is. Um, I mean, the construction and everything that it takes to put it together is is so relevant in, in the big picture of things. Um, I always tell, you know, potential clients that, you know, it's good to do your research, but it's also, I mean, you can buy a sofa one time or you can buy it 25 times. It's true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, what are you seeing right now? I, multi multifamily is one of the disciplines that, that, that you that you have. And I'm, I'm interested in what you're seeing from a multifamily standpoint, because I, I feel like, I feel like, because I'm hearing it from many of the, the designers and architects and builders that I speak to like this, there is a renaissance of multifamily and multi, multi, multi-generational living and design. And from a multifamily, you know, it's really interesting because we're starting to see different types of multifamily from mm -hmm multiple units to almost like a dormitory style living mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. there's individual Co rooms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. With a shared mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. individual bath, but then a shared kitchen and shared living spaces. Correct. Fascinating to me. Yes. That's it's like dormitory living. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. I have a client that introduced me to that in our area. It's not, a, a, I want to say it's something that's gradually creeping in but it's more so in like the New York, the main cities like that. Um, that's very fascinating. I know that as I live in the area and I see so many projects going up, it's kind of like, who are going to live in all these buildings that you guys are putting up? It's like, where are all these people coming from? But um, it's amazing. And people, you know, the, the generation that's paying for, you know, the, the easy access to everything, the less, the less um, complex living where, you know, you have someone in the building, a concierge that would walk your dog, um, that would receive your laundry, that would do various things, run some errands for you. That's kind of, you know, some of what you're seeing on the, on the larger scale of things, um, a building, and it could be a rental that they would have a massage area in the building that, you could schedule for someone to come in and you book the room and you're, you're getting that whole workout. So those are some of the things that, you know, that I've seen that I've worked on. What are clients asking you for now that they may not have been asking you for two years ago? Hmm. Me to move in. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> are you? No. Are you? Well, that's my, that's my little thing. I always tell clients, this has to be about you. I'm not moving in. So, 
you know, let's create based on your lifestyle. <laughs> but um, I mean, I find that more people, I mean, they're doing, there are more people that are actually stepping forward to request design help than before. Um, they're realizing that it's just like the, the normal thing that you would do if you get a massage regularly or you get a professional to do what you want done. Um, you can't do it yourself. But like we started in saying previously, you know, every, everyone is an interior designer today. Um, and there's so much secrets behind that, that element of things where, you know, you, you wonder as far as that's concerned. But I, I mean, I'm more so seeing that there are more people that are stepping up to the table and inquiring about having a professional create a space for them. Well, I, I, I think it's interesting too. um, you know, having the conversations that, that you've been having, you look things we all already know, um, that open living idea that was mm -hmm. so popular that everyone thought, oh, this is so great. Everything's open. Wasn't such a great idea in, in light of the fact that the, the world is going to be changing in different directions. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with the idea of open living if you're living in a 3,600 square foot house and you still have a basement and other rooms where people can go mm -hmm. and do their thing. If that is the case, then you need to make sure to have that low voltage wiring so that you're not drawing exclusively from a Wi-Fi because, you know, depending on the age of the house, you may not yeah. get good Wi-Fi in your space. Correct. Correct. You know? Yeah. Clients don't think of that because you can't find a picture of that on Instagram. <laughs> Very true. Very true. This is, I mean, Instagram is the be all and end all for a lot of people. If, if there was a heavyweight fight between Instagram and Pinterest, who would win? Instagram. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I, I, um, I don't use Pinterest as much as I use Instagram, but I get calls from people from Instagram. From a client standpoint, from a new business mm -hmm, standpoint. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that that's true. I think that most more more clients actually go and, and try to find inspiration on Pinterest, though, just because the, the, the format is different and you can see right. so many more pictures mm -hmm. of a particular topic that you're looking for. But, but you know, to that, to that point, I think that um, I'm curious to know if you change your approach between multifamily, commercial, and residential, as it relates to certain aspects, the the basic bone structure of the design, as as you see it. Hmm. More on the residential side. Yeah. How so? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think people. I, I think the the multifamily side is a little bit more um, you you have less square footage from that perspective. Um, so you get a little bit more wiggle room on the single family side. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. Um, what what do you imagine? Is there anything that you want to be doing from a business standpoint in five years from now? Where, where do you want to take the practice? And I, and I asked the question, this isn't the interview question. Where do you see yourself in five years from now? <laughs> the, the question is specifically because the industry is changing so rapidly. And because I'm, you know, I have all these conversations and, you know, if you go and look on Facebook and you're probably in many of the same design groups that I am, I think it's fascinating how many in the industry will just sort of latch on to whatever's new and figure this has got to be it. You know, like Clubhouse, you know, for a while Clubhouse was, oh my gosh, does anyone have an invitation to Clubhouse that they can send me? And there's nothing wrong with Clubhouse. I think it's, you know, any new social, socially interactive platform, platform environment is fantastic. I don't know that it's productive, as productive as, as other things are, I'm, I'm curious if you think that the ability now to work remotely and to work virtually is going to expand the practice or if it's going to open up any new avenues for you that you would like to pursue. Um, 
Well, for me, for one thing, hence me still having a library. Yeah. Um, I think, and I've always believed the design process is a romance. Um, I normally tell my clients when we first start to work together, it's a, it's a dating aspect of us getting to know each other. And then we change over to therapy because now I have to extract from you what you're feeling and wanting and wanting to share with me and ask me if I was crazy to present something like that. That's sort of a moment. And, um, and the other part of it is, is that I don't really, I mean, for me, it's always been a touchy feely. It's a romance. You have to touch the fabrics and, you know, you have to get involved from that perspective because the last thing you want is to have something come in and you say, Oh, I thought it was this way when you don't really have that, that romance with the things that you're specifying, because you're also selling people on your vision and being able to sell is also you're selling how it feels and how it would look. So I don't know that that's going to change that much um, unless there's another little wiggle room that we figure out on how you will be able to present the element of the senses um, using those senses. Um, in five years, I think I'll still be doing the, I hope I'll still be doing the same thing. I don't ever plan on retiring because I love what I do. I love all aspects of what I do. Um, the good days and the bad days, it keeps me grounded for reality in life. Um, go ahead. No, please continue. Um, so it's kind of, I used to, um, when I first started design, I looked forward to the day that I can wear bifocals. <laughs> okay. here i am okay <laughs> so the next stage would be a magnifying glass okay so i i hope to do this for a very long time to come and uh, i just look i look at all the i look at everything evolving and changing i really do yeah yeah to a certain degree yeah well look if you like change you're in the right field yeah. Especially now. Yeah. There's, there's a lot that's going on and I feel that um, change opens you up to new horizons. And I'm a firm believer. And I, I experience this all the time in my world where the universe forces me to take the next step on my journey. And it's just for me to wake up and see it. And if I don't, my journey gets a little bit more in, tightened for me to, to wake up and see it. I totally get that. I totally get that. And you know what? We will definitely check back and I will follow up with you on your journey because I'm excited to see where you're going to go. For those who are listening and you want to see some of the work, um, go down to the show notes and there will be links uh, to your work. I'm also going to link uh, to, to that, what the Kaleidoscope Design House. Oh, yeah. It was fun meeting that, designers from all over. Yeah, that was. Yeah, fun. that's really cool. I love that. Um, thank you for the time. This was so much fun. Thank you. Same here. Same here. Thank you for the time and conversation, Denise. You're amazing. Thank you, Thermosol, Article, York Wall Coverings, and Franz Wagner for your partnership and support. You are all remarkable partners and amazing allies for the trade. So thank you for that. And thank you for listening. Remember why you do what you do and that the business of design is about making better the lives of those we serve. Right? and staying true to ourselves at the same time. Until next week, be well, and take today first.